there's a problem. Uh, I'm, I'm used to teaching classrooms, so I'm used to shouting a lot because we in Moldova don't really have equipment like this, you know? Um, so if I'm shouting, just to do this. It works for my students. Um, so hi, everyone. Welcome to day one of EuroCamp. I have the honor of uh, breaking this. Um, my name is Ivan. I work at the Technical University of Moldova, out of all places. Uh, and I teach things like design patterns and such, right? Before I start talking about some of the experiments we had in the university, uh, I'd like to provide you with some context about where I come from. And this is Moldova. This is Chisinau. The IT industry in Moldova is primarily based on outsourcing, which is a bit different from what you have in innovation-based industries or product-based industries, right? Because for our country, it's very good because it creates a lot of good salaries, a lot of job positions, right, where people are paid very well. Did I break something again? Um, not innovating a lot, as you see. No? Okay, good. Uh, it creates a lot of good salaries, right? It, uh, it also, because all of these jobs are usually accessible to everyone, uh, they also have a very low barrier to entry. So you can basically write a bit of PHP, you're good to go, you're good to have a job, right? For us as an educational system, it can be a problem because it also has a bit of a darker side to it. A lot of our students who come to the university are studying for the wrong purpose. They only need to have a degree and not to have all the knowledge necessary for the degree, right? Can you hear me? Okay, this is better. Uh, I broke it for everyone else. Yay! So getting back to the outsourcing industry and how it works for our country and for our university is that unfortunately a lot of students are getting into university for the wrong things. They want to get a degree so they could apply to their jobs, right? And moreover, because the barrier of entry is so low, uh, a lot of students already work while they are studying, so they don't come to classes. And this is a very bad thing for us as a university, right? And um, of course, this is a systemic issue. We need to address it as a systemic issue. However, as a small team at the university, we tried to switch the focus a little. Instead of punishing the bad performers, we thought of why wouldn't we provide more value to, for, to incentivize people to come to our classes? Why wouldn't we give something that would be immediately applicable? So if you work right now at a Drupal shop, right, and you come to the design patterns course, you need to have something that you could apply today. And for us, as course designers, it means that we need to synchronize very well with the industry and identify what is important from the industry so we could incorporate that into our curricula. Cool. So let's find some things we can teach. Of course, the first thing is the actuals, are the actual subjects. But for me, design patterns have been the same for quite a while. So what else can we give? Well, this talk will focus on two things, skills and values. So skills that we want to have as an industry and values that we want to, uh, to believe in. Of course, while teaching skills and values, we also have to make it fun and a bit of engage and engaging for our students, but always keep focusing on the fact that the skills and the values we pass need to be relevant to the industry. So let's start with skills. What skills are relevant to the industry that we can incorporate in our courses? And this is a pretty tricky question because it demands an objective answer. Now, I would rather twist this question and pose a different one. What skills, instead of trying to identify what skills are important for the industry, why not identify what skills are important for me? Or rather, what skills I would like my next teammate to have, my future teammate, right? Because we've all been frustrated 
with the fact that someone comes along and they don't, they don't know how to Google things or something else, right? So what are the skills that you consider important for your future teammate? I tried to identify a couple. For me, it's reading the source code or not being afraid to dive into the source code. Another skill, I believe, is debugging. Right? People, I think we need to debug and we need to teach debugging. And we need to put people in positions where they have to choose tools. This is a skill that can be trained. So going over them one by one, I'd like to discuss some of the examples we implemented uh, as course designers in order to, well, facilitate these skills. So, reading source code. The most important thing about reading source code is not being afraid to go to the source as an authoritative source, right? Um, this means that we have to do some life coding classes. And the life code experience while we're teaching, right, and we're writing code live, um, actually eliminates some of the barriers that students have because they see the typos we make, they see the fact that I write pretty bad C++ code, and they're not ashamed of it. And they also are engaged, everyone is, because they can write the simplest class. They can tell me how to write it. Another way we could, um, we could train reading source code is by giving assignments with source code, and not with a couple lines of it, but with a couple of files. Then we can jump a bit further and show actual code to illustrate a concept. For instance, while I teach design patterns, um, I found a little gem on, uh, on GitHub. This is called uh, YouTube DL. It's a program, not too small, not too big. It's a Python thing that downloads videos from YouTube, right, and a couple of other places. And during the course, we took this thing, we had to read the documentation, to go look at the source and see how to extend this app. Uh, and this was exactly what was the strategy pattern. So it wasn't a textbook example, but a live, real example. The second skill is debugging. And by debugging, I don't mean attaching a debugger or setting breakpoints, break right? I mean digging. Digging into hard problems that are not at the surface. This, I believe, is something that is missing from a lot of engineers these days, or any days, even. Uh, and here's an example we used in class during debugging. Right? This is um, how the high scores leaderboard for uh, Flappy Bird looks like. Remember Flappy Bird, right? It was, it was one year ago, the example, so it was a thing. This is the highest score. You can imagine that it's a couple of universes old. And this is an interesting debugging question. Because when we came to the students and when we asked ourselves, how did they get this? Right? This is a software issue. This incentivizes students to to dig a little and to find out how could they actually get this. And while digging, they develop a couple of other skills as well. So to teach debugging as a skill, we need to provide a good context, an engaging context for students. We need to teach debugging as a whole. And that way, we will have a couple of other skills developed along the way. For instance, Googling. Googling is an important thing, right? And moreover, in this very example, you're not always thinking about Googling how to convert 64-bit uh, integers into something something, right? So that's debugging. Good. Tool choice. We have a lot of pressure in our work because there's a lot of tools available, and we need to choose them. And especially when we choose the wrong tools, we face 
pretty dire consequences for our projects, right? Sometimes. So what if we could help the students choose a tool and eliminate the risk and the consequence, thus encouraging students to be pragmatic and reasonable in their choice. Right? This will actually provide them with an experience of choosing tools without the risk itself. And then let's have a discussion about why did we choose a particular tool. Um, for instance, in our class, we had to choose uh, a Ruby HTTP library. And there are 27 projects listed on Ruby Toolbox. This is something you need to go through a couple of times, and then it would help you do that in real life. So getting back to the skills, we had three skills with their respective examples. We have to read the source code. We have to develop debugging skills and Googling skills. And we have to go through an experience of choosing tools. Values. Remember, with skills, right, we had to identify what skills are important for the industry. The same thing applies for the values. Right? What values are important for the industry? And we can, of course, uh, apply the same approach to asking, what values do I want my future teammate to have? And for me, here's a couple. I want them to be able to appreciate constant progress over larger jumps, right? So slow and incremental things. I want them to think in concepts and not in particular implementations or in code. And I would like my next teammate or my next pair, if you will, to be able to own their code to claim ownership of the things they built. And this needs to be somehow integrated into the curriculum. So let's start. Constant progress. The main thing about constant progress is that when we try to teach test-driven development, we focus on the test parts. And a lot of the times, this especially to students or to people who already work and who have already seen tests, this highlights a different value of test-driven development, that it helps us get rid of bugs. Whereas the, the, the whole why do we write tests first thing is that we set small milestones and we get there, right? We take the bigger problem, we split it into smaller chunks, and we take them one by one. So how can we encourage that in our students? We can give them a program with existing code and tests. They're not familiar with tests yet. But we can tell them, hey, if you run this in your IDE, or if you run this script, you'll get a grade. Right? The more green you see, the better your grade is, which is good. Right? We condition that. Then we can give a program without code, but with tests. And you need to write the tests. And you can use the tests as a guiding tool for your design. Then we can give you a program to write. And some students were so uh, comfortable with the approach of incremental building that they had to write their own tests. And without highlighting the value of, hey, it gets you rid of bugs, we could incentivize students to write tests. As an example, they had to explore the builder pattern in Smalltalk. Uh, so they had to see a lot of green. If you make all of these green, you get the highest mark, right? Which is OK. Next value, concepts over code. A lot of times when we speak about concepts and not code, we try to make this, this is a singleton in Java, look like this, this is a singleton in Ruby. So we try to give all the possible implementations of a singleton and say to the student, hey, um, this is pretty much what it looks like. Try to distill what you need from it. Uh, I tried that, it didn't work very well. 
What worked better was having a discussion and trying to come up with metaphors and being frank about the fact that, hey, it's hard to take the singleton pattern and apply it to your JavaScript job because you need to know lots of other stuff. Uh, it's hard because we cannot introduce the same concepts of module pattern or things like that to someone who writes Java or Android, right? Uh, or sometimes we can even pair them and help them identify the concept from the code. So if you have someone who writes Android, pair them with someone who writes Python for a living and make, help them uh, identify the pattern from the code. And the last value I think is uh, important for us as an industry is owning code. Uh, a lot of the times when we teach these or when we have these best practices, right, or patterns or things like that, um, they are because our industry as an engineering practice is slightly different than other industries. The product of our creation, as opposed to this very building, changes, radically changes over time. And this is why we develop these practices that helps us design things for change. Now, the important thing here is that when we teach the patterns themselves, we don't incorporate change. We don't build bigger things. So let's try and build bigger things during the course and incorporate change. Try to change the requirements as a market would. And then you will get a different kind of reward as a student. You will get ease of maintenance and you can get features done quickly, right? This is the reward. And otherwise, if you cannot get the features done quickly, you will feel the pain of poorly designed software without having to actually risk your business for it. As an example, uh, last semester we had to write a markdown parser. So students got a subset of markdown, a bit of custom markdown. And they knew that there will be changes. So um, they had to upload their code, receive the changes to the format, so something was different, and they had to implement those changes as quickly as they could. So back to the values, we had appreciation of constant progress, we had concepts over code, and code ownership. Of course, these things coupled with skills give a lot of our students uh, some of the things they need to apply today. However, it's boring, right? It, it has a lot of bullet points, it's boring. Uh, so we need to make it fun. And this is Alexei de Chinchilla. Uh, he is my ultimate tool of making things fun. It doesn't work very well, but oh well. For example, I try to add a bit of silliness in the assignments uh, by integrating the chinchilla. For example, uh, Alexei is a bit older now, uh, so he needs to make a family. So he wrote himself a dating app uh, that downloads pictures of chinchillas from all over the internet. And uh, since he has a 2G connection, uh, he you have to optimize the app, basically. But he wrote some tests, too, so he's good at that. Uh, so while you're building this app, right, while you're solving this assignment, you have to look at a lot of chinchillas. And you're sitting there at night, right, solving the assignment for the course, and then you see this. And then you need to figure out what this is, and even later, right, when the, when the sun is almost up, you see something like this. And you get to class, you submit your assignment, you go like you're very tired and such, and then you have a thank you note from Alexei the Chinchilla because you helped him. This makes it a bit more fun. <laughs> um, so these are skills and values that are important for the industry. And we have to wrap it, them into a bit of fun.
However, I think there's something missing here. I think there's something missing that defines us, us, the people who are here at Eurocamp, that have something special than other communities do. And this is the spirit we have. The spirit that is better defined as the hacker spirit, right? The, our way of taking things apart, uh, putting them together, seeing if they work, right? Changing things, uh, if, even if they work properly. Uh, displaying curiosity towards new languages. I mean, look at, the, look at the talks here. It's new stuff. Continuous exploration. Uh, and when you encounter something that doesn't really work for you, you just hack it, right? You just change it. So it would solve your particular problem. And you can hack anything, basically. Uh, in our example, uh, our teaching curriculum didn't really work for us. Our way of teaching didn't work for us. So what we did was we took the hacking philosophy and we applied it to the thing we knew, which was teaching. And as a matter of fact, this was a very vivid example for our students because we were very open about it. This was a very vivid example of hacking itself because we were open and we said, hey, we, we're not sure this is the way it should work, but uh, let's give it a try. And it actually taught a bit of hacking while we were uh, hacking teaching. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do you have any tips how to convince our teachers at our universities to make something more applicable? This is a very good question. Uh, can we make our teachers or help our teachers at our universities uh, make something better? Is that correct? Um, I, I believe we can. Uh, we can by inviting <laughs> uh, teachers here at Eurocamp, uh, by sharing the experience and being uh, absolutely frank about the fact that the industry is moving at a much uh, faster, quicker pace than uh, the academia mostly. Um, but also, it's, it's very neat that some of these techniques and some of these skills and values are applicable to other ways of teaching, like, uh, like Rails girls or, or, or um, hack days or things like that. And uh, I believe we, we as a community can, can focus on trying to incorporate these techniques or other techniques that we consider important in a newer format, something that maybe is not in academia. Is that okay? Any other questions? I have two minutes left, so I can dance. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> Thank you.